All right, awesome. Well, thank you everyone for uh, for uh, attending. Uh, I appreciate it as always. Uh, the topic of this presentation is DAX is easy until it isn't. I'm going to put uh, PowerPoint in the presentation mode. Move that off of my screen here. Put that over on another screen so that I can see you all. And you're welcome to to chat questions or raise your hands. Uh, I'll 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 pause in certain places, but uh, this is a fairly informal presentation. I I put this together because um, you know as as a Power BI well as Power BI users, um, Power BI is a tool that just covers such a broad spectrum of capabilities and and skills. And uh, I find that DAX is, is one of these languages that was really engineered to be simple. Uh, however, it, it can do a lot of complicated things. I'm going to move my microphone over here so you can hear me. I assume you can hear me just a little bit better now. I have the mic in front of me. Um, but, uh, but this is a beginner level session. So just to kind of level set, set expectations. Uh, I'm assuming that um, you do not have deep skills with DAX. Uh, if so, I think a lot of this you'll find, uh, you might find interesting, but uh, it may not necessarily be educational. But uh, my name is Paul Turley. I'm a, a director with Three Cloud Solutions. We are a consultancy based in the US. Uh, most of us work entirely remotely. Uh, we have a main office just south of Chicago. We have an office in, in Tampa, Florida. Um, I'm in Southwest Washington. We have people all over the States. Uh, and uh, uh, we have a few people who work in India and we have uh, a large contingent uh, of folks who, who work out of Manila, uh, Philippines. About 700, 750 people. We are currently the um, uh, Microsoft US Partner of the Year. We are entirely focused on um, on the Azure cloud, on the Microsoft cloud. And uh, I've been a member of the Microsoft MVP program for about 14 years now and uh, enjoy being involved in the community. But uh, this this was a deck that was put together for a conference about a year ago, so I'll move past our, uh, our, our sponsor slides. A uh, little about me, just very, very quickly. Uh, I actually started out in the TV news business. Uh, quite a while ago, I've, I've been at this for quite a while, and I had an injury on the job, and I had to take a desk job. And uh, uh, so after I broke my foot, uh, I started working for a healthcare software company. And uh, thank you for the coffee, my dear. And uh, I, uh, I, I found that I love working with data reporting, and uh, particularly analytics. And so my career has kind of been a volley back and forth between um, between doing training and consulting, and and now I'm I'm supporting a large group of people who do consulting work and establishing our best practices, doing training internally. Uh, I had a chance to write a few books. Um, I wrote all of the Rockspress books on reporting services. And uh, anyway, enough about me. Let's let's get on to what we're going to talk about. So what, why, what, what is DAX and why is it important? And you know, why do we have this, this language um, called DAX, data analysis expressions? And um, we're going to cover a couple of different uh, topics. I, I think that understanding these concepts is key to really appreciating what DAX is and the mechanics of the language, which will help you be able to understand and be able to use it in the future. So these are some things that we're we're going to talk about today: filters and context. We're going to talk about row context, filter context. We'll talk about aggregator functions, iterator functions. And this concept of context transition. Let's say the context transition is probably not uh, uh, an uber important topic compared to some other things. It's just something I like to say. It slips off the tongue, context transition. But uh, get PowerPoint to behave as we move on. All right. So um, DAX isn't so hard uh, until it is. And what I mean by that is that DAX was really engineered to be a very approachable language. It was engineered to be a language that that looks like and behaves like Excel, because that's a tool that, that, that most people know how to use. And so I'm going to show you how to use DAX. I'm going to show you the mechanics of DAX in Excel before we move over to Power BI Desktop. 
If you look at, at functions like sum, min, max, average, these are things that, that look very Excel-like and uh, they're pretty easy to figure out. And then you kind of hit this wall as you're progressing through your skills and things become very challenging as we, we uh, start using uh, iterator functions like sum X and um, time series functions like dates MTD and total MTD and summarize and cross filter. And then things just can become really, really crazy and, and quite complicated as we start getting into more complex functions. And so DAX is kind of this blue sky language that has a lot of complexity to it. The good news is that most of us don't really need to use the really complicated stuff day to day, unless you're uh, you know, doing heavy duty you know, scientific evaluation and, and deep statistical analysis. Still, a lot of that stuff is still pretty, pretty easy. So um, some concepts that are important, DAX is a table-based functional language. And that means that a lot of the functions return table objects. So you have to kind of get your head in that space. I'm going to call this function. It's going to bring back a table and I need to do something with that table. The, the evolution of DAX is that um, it, it, it resembles in many ways Excel formulas. It has its roots in SQL. So if you've worked with data in the past, you're probably familiar with uh, uh, some or a lot of SQL statements. And you may be aware of a language that predated DAX called MDX or multidimensional expressions. And the genesis of that is that way back in 1998, Microsoft acquired a code base from a company called Panorama that became SQL Server OLAP services, which then turned into analysis services, and MDX was the, the, the query and expression language for analysis services. And uh, MDX was, is a very, very powerful language. I think it's a very elegant language, but a lot of people just couldn't figure it out. And uh, the Microsoft knew that for Power BI to become mainstream, for it to become something that was easy for less technical people to use, they we needed a language that wasn't MDX. And so um, they applied DAX in oh, 2010 up to 2013 or so to Power Pivot for Excel, which we're going to use here pretty quick, to Power BI, and to Analysis Services tabular models. And uh, it's, it's kind of proven itself to be a very, very capable technology. And we're probably going to see it uh, in other products as, as Power BI and the Vertipak engine are, are incorporated into Microsoft products. All right, so context is everything. I'm just going to kind of put a pin in each of these topics, and then um, I'll do some demonstrations to demonstrate what they mean. Row context uh, might seem to sound like a, a, a complicated thing, but it's not really. It just means what row am I on in a given table? Now, knowing what row you're on in a table that's related to another table um, causes things to happen. So let's say that I have selected a product and that product is related to my sales table. And so knowing what product I've selected or what, what, what product I'm looking at, let's say it's on a chart and I've grouped by product. I have all of my products listed, you know, on, as a bar on each chart. And that causes a, a, a filter, uh, changes the filter context of a related table. So row context is what row am I on? Filter context is as a result of some kind of slicing or filter propagation caused through row context, how is that what how does that change the filter context of a particular table? There are different ways that we can slice and filter tables, and one of them is by changing the row context of a related table. Um, context transition is essentially what, what I just described. It means that row context becomes filter context. And that often happens uh, through what's called filter propagation. In other words, filtering one table causes a related table to be filtered. All right, so let's let's jump into some familiar territory. I am going to open up Excel. Bear with me just a second as I figure out where my window is. There.
All right, I've got about 10 instances of Excel open on my desktop. So let me jump over here and get centered. So this is my sample data. I've purposely chosen a, a very, very simple set of data just for demonstration purposes. And so here we have four different tables. I have a month table, location table, a product table, and a sales table. Now, uh, you'll notice that the, the month table has a key, a month number. And so just to simplify things, rather than having to, to store the name of, of the month in our sales table, we've used a key, a month number. So you can see that there's a column in the sales table that, that corresponds to, to the month table, these numbers. Same thing with location. We have a location ID. So we're using keys again, just to keep things nice and lean. And then just for variety, I, I decided to use letters for the product ID. It really doesn't matter if they're numbers or letters. Typically in the, in the database world, we typically use integer values as keys. But again, you can see that month is represented here, location there and product here. And then each record in the sales table um, has a, a numeric value. So there's the quantity, the price each, and the total price for an order or a sale, uh, which, which takes place on a month and at a location and for a particular product. All right, now, I have created a, a data model, a semantic data model using these four tables, and this is what we call a star schema or, uh, or a dimensional model. And... Uh, I'm gonna jump over here and and uh, after I, I imported the contents of each of these tables into my dimensional model. In fact, I'll, I'll show you that model. So uh, I'm using Power Pivot behind Excel. If I uh, hit the Manage button, that should open up my Power Pivot window. We'll switch that over to Diagram View. And you can see here that this is my dimensional model. So I have relationships between each of these tables based on these keys, all right? This really is kind of an essential concept in Power BI. Um, if you can get as close as possible to a star schema, you actually won't need to write a lot of DAX. It'll be much, much easier. And, uh, but, but that's what's going on here. So I'm gonna go ahead and close that window. I'm gonna dismiss the cat from my desk if I can. And I have a pivot table. Now, um, I have a measure in my model called units sold, which just calculates the sum of the quantity column in my sales table. So there's our, our first piece of DAX right there. I've just put this, this uh, here in Excel just for reference. Um, it's actually embedded in my model. But this is a pivot table that um, is based on the... Uh, items that I've selected here. I'm going to move to another sheet and we're going to take a look at what would happen if I were to filter or slice my pivot table based on my model here. So if I were to select February from the month table, you can see that here's here's the uh, the filter uh, section of, of this pivot table up here where I've done this. So I'm saying that I'm selecting February I'm going to select Oregon as my location, and I'm going to select Sprocket as my product. So here you can see my, my filters up here, where I've essentially sliced the sales table. So the question is, what is the row context of the month table? How would you describe the row context of the month table? And the way that we would describe that is we would say, the row context of the month table is month equals February, location equals Oregon product equals sprocket. And that through filter propagation, meaning that you've filtered this table, which is related to this table, I'm only going to look at these rows, just based on the month table. Within that subselection, I'm looking at locations, Oregon, that's number two. Now I've whittled things down to this selection, and I'm only interested in sprocket, which is C, which means that the filter context of the sales table is this row and this row. And so if we execute uh, our, our DAX expression now, sum of sales quantity, we're going to get three plus three is six. So 
that's that's kind of the the the, the simple mechanics of of DAX. If you just boil it down to its core components. So if you can get your head around just that that kind of that 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 simple Rubik's cube, that 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 simple machine that's saying, all right, I'm going to choose a row on this table, a row on this table, a row on this table, and that's going to filter this related table, then um, all of your your DAX expressions should should make a little more sense. Now let's let's make this just a little more complex and say, all right, well we're going we're going to choose January this time, and I'm going to select Washington and Oregon. Now it's debatable. Uh, whether we can say row context is Washington and Oregon, um, because that you you obviously we have two uh, items selected, but the we know that the filter context of the location table is both Washington and Oregon, and the filter propagation does boil down to the sales table again, where you can see location IDs one and two there, and that brings us down to that subselection. I'm not selecting a product. Therefore, the row context of product is no rows are selected. The filter context is it's wide open. It's not filtered. Therefore, we don't filter on that. And now in order to get our units sold, we're going to add up the quantity column and that equals 61. So simple stuff so far, don't you think? All right, any questions so far? Let's report back in the chat. I'm good. All right. Okay. All right. Another quick example. I won't walk you through this because I think this is pretty simple stuff. So in this case, I'm selecting two different months. And uh, so that brings us down to, to the ones and the threes, Washington, California. That uh, brings us down to a subselection. With the product selection, we only have two rows. And again, seven plus six is 13. All right. Pretty darn simple stuff. So let's switch over to... Power BI desktop next. And while we're doing that, I'll uh, switch back to my PowerPoint. All right, so the terms slicing and filtering slicing simply means that you're you're taking a slice of a table the, the 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 reason that the word slice was used is that in the days of multi-dimensional cubes a, a cube really was a physical representation of data the the data was actually organized on disk in hierarchical fashion with each of the related tables being facets if you will of a cube and uh, we, you know, we we could have uh, more than six different facets. You know, a cube has 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 six faces on it, but uh, uh, for it, as many tables, dimension tables, or um, uh, or attributes of a dimension table, there was actually a physical path. And so by selecting a particular product in this case, or a month in this case, you were literally slicing that cube down to a subsection of, of, of little, little um, uh, tuples within that cube. And so the, the word slicing became um, popular and we still, we still use slicing today. Slicing is a method of filtering, but there are different ways of filtering. You can filter by calling a function. We can filter programmatically, um, but we slice simply by selecting something on a visual and that causes filtering to take place. All right, so let's take a look at um, how this relates to Power BI Desktop now. So I'm going to... Jump over here. So same thing going on here. I've actually imported data from that Excel uh, workbook. And here you can see the same model represented in Power BI Desktop. So both Power Pivot in Excel and Power BI, Power BI utilize the, the VertiPack in-memory analytic engine. It works exactly the same way. It puts all of this data in memory. And then we have relationships that are defined between tables on keys. And, and this is why you're, you're always encouraged to build a, a star schema or a dimensional model. Uh, users of, of tools like uh, Tableau, for example, uh, don't encourage and really aren't based on the, the necessity to have tables that are related to each other. 
Um, hold on just a second. I'm going to close the door to my office. All right. The dogs and the cats are invading. So I will show you that I have a number of measures defined here. So here's my units sold measure. You'll see the expression right up here. Bear with me while I run zoom in. All right, so you see that, that uh, DAX expression right here again very 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 simple we're going to start kind of compounding this now so we're just saying that that regardless of the way that you slice and filter the sales table i'm just going to to sum up the quantity column very simple stuff looks a lot like excel and um here as we create a visual with the month and the product let me rearrange rearrange that here in effect we're doing the same thing on each row we're saying well the row context of the of the month table is january the row context of the product table is gadget and so if we take that slice of the sales table and add up the quantity you're going to get 13. and so it's important to understand that every calculated value is calculated in the context of that row within this visual and uh, if we were to, to actually peek behind the scenes, you'd see that there is a DAX query created that says uh, group by month and group by product and then calculate cell by cell the units sold. So again, uh, row context, row context, filter context in the sales table. At the total, um, essentially we're saying, what is the filter context of the entire month table and the product table, apply that to the sales table and then calculate the, the total just based on, on the, the entire um, context. All right, and page two. All right, now let's jump over to a slightly more complex demonstration. So aggregator functions like sum are processed over all rows in a table based on the filter context of that table. So meaning once we've filtered the table down, we have this column of, of values and we're just going to apply the sum just like Excel does. Okay, so those are, that's the mechanics of an aggregator function. Sum, average, min, max, count, count distinct, these are all aggregator functions. They're applied essentially over a column of, of values. I just went, went back to PowerPoint and it covered up teams, so I can't see. All right, we've got a couple of uh, comments slash questions. Let me back up a little bit. Comments so far, it looks like DAX is uh, automated pivots. I, 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 Harry, I would say that that's a pretty accurate description. Um, but yes, but give it some time. So yeah, sure. If we're just looking at the sum function uh, with these simple examples, yeah, we're just pivoting and 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 uh, and adding up data. But uh, it, it can get far more complex than that. Um, VBA pivots for analysis. Yeah, I, I would I would say that that that's that's where a lot of this came from. And if you know we go back in time and look at the way that that uh, reporting tools have have worked in years past, yes, that's how we came to evolving the DAX language. But it can get far more complex than this. It would be interesting to see the star schema used in a cube schema. Well, uh, I, I would say that a cube is a different way of representing a star, or can be. All right, we're not going to get into the, the 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 details, the differences between multidimensional and and uh, and and in memory models. So iterator functions are are a, are a different beast. Um, the reality is that aggregator functions internally use iterator functions. Um, they just use them in a different context. So there's a set of functions that correspond to our aggregator functions that have the letter X at the end, sum X, average X, min X, et cetera. And these are processed one row at a time with the result for the table. 
So what that means is that if we have an expression that's more than just go add up my quantity, that expression is going to be applied at the row level, one row at a time, and then we're going to get the, the, the aggregated result of those iterated values. So let's, let's take a look at this. So in my model, let's say that I've been asked to um, calculate the, uh, let's, let's see, one second. I've been asked to calculate the average order price. And so my business stakeholder essentially has said, all right, well, the average order price is the um, the 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 total divided by the quantity. That's the average order price. And so I'm going to calculate that. So here's my average order price. I'm going to say, all right, well, you said that it's the total price divided by or divided into the sales quantity. Now, we're, I'm going to use the divide function rather than the forward slash so that if either of, of these values are zero or blank, that I'm not going to get a, a division by zero error. So that's usually a good idea. But uh, so, I mean, this is exactly what my, my stakeholder told me to do. And so for January, we're taking the total price and we're dividing that into the quantity for January. And I, I get this value. And then for February, I'm doing the same thing. For March, I'm doing the same thing. And then we're going to do that for the total. And my my stakeholder looks at that and says, you know, that that just it that doesn't look right at all. Um so if if we were to take the sales, all of the sales in January, and for each of those sales, we were to take the the total price and divide it by the quantity. And uh, we say, oh, wait a second, that, that's not what you said. You said, take the total price and divide it by the quantity for January. And you just said, do it for each of my sales. So if I do that for each of my sales, that's going to look like this. So I want the average. And so I'm going to say, I want to average every row in my sales table. For each row, take the total price and divide it into the quantity, take that result for each row in the sales table, and then average all of those values depending on the way that I've, I've grouped this. So we're going to say that for January, let's say that that represents 20 rows, we're going to do this 20 different times and then take the average of those values and we're going to get a different value altogether. Same thing for February, same thing for March. And then we're going to start all over again and do the same thing for the total. All right. So the question is, which which is the the right way to do it? And the answer is it depends. It's a business question. It's it's a business rule question. And that's usually going to be the right answer is we, we, we may have to go back to our stakeholder and say, okay, well, you said it was this. You said that this was the business rule. Did I understand that or have we missed something? So what do I use an aggregator or an iterator? What questions do we have so far? Looks like DAX is a declarative is declarative like SQL instead of procedural? Um, I would say that it is. However, it is also function-based. Um, so yeah, there there certainly are some similarities between DAX and SQL. But uh, um, SQL is a statement-based language, where DAX is a function-based language. So the, some of the mechanics may be uh, similar and in common, but uh, um, there there are some some significant differences as well. All right. All right, so under the hood, the sum function actually calls the sum x function. Um, what, what it is essentially is doing is it's saying just over whatever table I'm, I'm uh, I, that this column exists in, 
I want to iterate over the records in this table without changing any context. You're going to get the same result if you do these two different things. Just know that if you were to look under the hood, you would actually see that this is what sum is doing. Um, I, I took a, a dimensional modeling and advanced DAX class from uh, Marco Russo of uh, SQL BI, and he makes a point of not using aggregator functions so that you can actually see mechanically what's going on. Quite honestly, I, I, I found it a little confusing, and uh, I make a point to use the, the aggregator functions when uh, that's all I need to do. So let's take a look at a, a slightly more complex version. Now, I'm going to need to open up another Power BI project in order to show you some more complex things. So bear with me as I do that. Uh, this is the part where I n normally have set up ahead of time, but since uh, I was uh, had my schedule mixed up, um, just bear with me as I open this up. Ah, that is not not the uh, solution that I wanted. All right, good time to ask questions while I'm fishing around trying to find the uh, the uh, right uh, yeah, demo I was... project. Well... I was just dipping in on the uh, whether or not it's declarative like SQL, and it's yes, it is declarative, but is it like SQL? Sometimes yes, sometimes no, depending on what you're trying to get it to do. I think if you approach it with a SQL mindset, you can come a cropper quite quickly um, because there's definitely some new concepts you need to really sort of start to understand and learn. And I and I think that the you know the 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 important point there is don't try to translate um yep. you know i mean we're all we're all familiar with different languages but if you you try to say oh well that that's really this you know um sql and dax exist separately for different reasons one of the great challenges that i i, I often see is that um database professionals will that will use the tool that they're familiar with, SQL in this case, to solve a lot of problems. So they may pre-calculate values and store them in a table. And the problem with that is that you 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 can't you can't slice a value. You can't get a calculation in context if it's already been pre-calculated and stored in a row. Therefore, SQL can't solve the problem of of um, of performing a calculation in the context of the way that a user has interacted with a report. In other words, if they've said, okay, well, you know, this set of products in this region, on this date, for this, for this, for this, DAX is very good at performing those calculations very, very quickly, uh, where, you know, sure, you, you can do equivalent things with SQL, but the mechanics are very, very different and not nearly as efficient. All right, um, let's take a look at um, some time series. Uh, again, bear with me. I'm still trying to find my, uh, my example here. Ah.
All right, I'm gonna have to revert to uh, to uh, doing this by hand. I'm uh, I'm waiting for a, a file to download. It's on my OneDrive, but it's not on my my uh, machine, so I'm actually waiting for that to download right now. So bear with me. All right. While I'm waiting for that, I'm going to move ahead. So um, learning DAX, um, this this was this list was actually created in, in uh, 2016. I, I had been asked to to do a uh, a uh, pre-conference day at uh, a uh, conference up in Montreal uh, in 2016. So um, Power BI Desktop didn't exist yet, at least not at this time. It was actually released in 20. 2016, a little bit later. Um, it existed in Power Pivot and in SQL Server Analysis Services um, Tabular. And so this was the complete list of all of the DAX functions at the time. I, I would I would guess that this list is about twice as long. So if you were to try to memorize all of these functions, it would be a bit like this. Understanding the concepts and the 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 essential functions is far more important than memorizing functions. Um, you can always look up function syntax as long as you understand what you're looking for and you can describe the problem that you're trying to solve. And um, though you can always Google the answer, oftentimes you'll get bad examples. So don't necessarily uh, depend on just Googling the answer. Um, I find that once I've solved a problem, if I can keep a sample of that solution, it's a lot easier for me to go back to a problem I've solved in the past and look at my own code than it is to go understand somebody else's code. Now, that being said, there are a lot of good references for DAX, and probably the probably the the best and the most notable is uh, the the SQL BI site. If you go to daxpatterns.com or go to sqlbi.com and and look up DAX patterns, lots of great examples that uh, that uh, Marco and Alberto have have put together over the years as they've kind of established themselves as the de facto experts. Uh, but there are a lot of people in the community who uh, have contributed as well. Um, so where did DAX come from? Uh, so back in 2016, I actually did a web search at the time, and the only thing that I could find was um, DAX Shepard. And if you're a, a Star Trek geek, you you may be familiar with the uh, the character Jadzia Dax. Those are the only hits that I got when I was looking for Dax at the time. I went to Wikipedia, couldn't find anything. So I wrote this article. So I was the first author of the Wikipedia article on Dax back in 2016. Uh, Marco jumped in and enhanced it. And since then, several people have, have enhanced it. But uh, that's how new Dax is. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> there are there are some other DAXs in the world, uh, yes. So let's take a look at at the basic measure pattern. So if um, we've already seen a very very simple example of you know it's sold just using the sum function, you know just like Excel, the calculate function is the next function that you'll typically be introduced to. And calculate modifies the um, context of a a calculation. In other words. We're saying, well, go go calculate the sum of the the sales quantity, but calculate it in the context of the location table having values Washington or Oregon or Idaho. So this essentially says, create a context and then apply this calculation in that context. There are also functions that will alter the filter context of tables. And here's an example of where we're saying, all right, regardless of the way that we have sliced or filtered the location table, if, if, if a user has chosen a filter, if a user is using a slicer, if they've chosen a different state, I don't care about any of that. I want to alter the filter context of the location table using the all function. So this is a, a 
a table-based function. It's going to return a table. In this case, it's, it's going to return the entire location table, actually just the state column. So it returns a table of, of single column values that overrides the filter context of that table. And so here we're saying, well, calculate the sum of sales quantity for all states, regardless of that. And that that's actually going to be used um, in another calculation, which I'll show you here. Let me jump over to Easy DAX again. And here's all states. So let's say if I were to create a slicer for state, I'm trying to acquaint myself with the new um, on object uh, uh, selections here and Oh, they've moved it up here. All right, so we've created a slicer. And if I go and say, all right, I want to see units sold in all states. Let's start with units sold. and units sold in the Pacific Northwest. Let me turn those around. Did I not rearrange these? Oh, well, I'm not going to worry about it. All right, so there's units sold, 195. And if I... And I Sorry, I am going to rearrange these. All right, so here's unit sold. If I were just to choose Arizona, we don't have any sales in Arizona, so we're not going to get any units sold. Let's switch that to California. So you can see that naturally gets sliced. Here's my units sold in all states. Since I'm overriding the filter context of state by saying, just give me all states regardless of anything that I've selected, then um, I'm going to get 195 regardless of what I select. Here's another uh, measure here where um, I'm saying where the state is in Washington or Oregon or Idaho. So let's go back and see what the result of this is. If I choose Oregon, Washington, and Idaho, you can, s oops. You can see that that combination gives me 121. And that's what I'm doing in this measure. If I select say add California, you can see that that brings me up to 195, but because th this measure is restricted to Oregon, Washington, and Idaho, it's 121. So what? why am I doing this? Why is this important? Well, I wanna be able to calculate the um, percentage of contribution. So since I have my units sold in all states, I can refer to that measure and refer to another measure. I don't have to repeat my expressions over and over again. So here I'm just going to divide units sold into units sold for all states to give me the contribution of whatever I've selected. So let me go put this in another card. So my units sold contribution goes here. And so if I select Washington, that's 36 units in all states is 195 units and that's uh, 18 percent i can choose washington and oregon i'm going to get 62 percent again that's 121 over 195. 
Okay. All right. Now for something completely different. Um, once you understand these basic kind of fundamental concepts, you can apply them in a lot of different places. And so here's an example of a complex mod or a com complex model where I really have the same dimension tables. Here's my date dimension, store dimension, product dimension, et cetera, and my fact tables. And I can calculate the the, the same kinds of things um, in a larger model, really using the the same basic mechanics. And uh, this is where I need to have the right model open. So again, bear with me while I get to this. Oh, sorry, that is not it. All right, I'm going to have to build this measure. Sorry, the uh, the uh, sample project that I had ready was not the one that I had prepared for this demo. So we're going to open that one. All right, how are, how are we on time? Uh, do we uh, wrap up in six minutes? Um, so we started a little bit late and there's a 15 minute gap. So if you overrun by five minutes or so, it'll be fine. So you've got about 10. Okay. So the comment about about MDX is is interesting, and that that is a true statement that that MDX was a language that was engineered engineered for multi-dimensional um, models or cubes. The interesting thing is that um, that MDX can be used against a tabular model uh, analysis services. The analysis services tabular engine actually has a mechanism that translates MDX. Uh, into I don't know if it translates it into DAX, but you can actually use MDX. And and the reason that that's notable is that Excel still emits MDX. So that Excel pivot table I was using earlier that actually generates MDX queries, which um, are presented to the tabular model, which then has to say, ah, okay, that's not my native language, but I understand it. You know, I took the 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 Duolingo course, and so I understand enough MDX to give you the results. So, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know that this information is particularly useful other than, um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to understand the history. But for the purpose of compatibility, MDX can still be used against tabular. It's just not as efficient. All right. What I wanted to show you is how these concepts can now be applied to uh, performing time series calculations. So, Here, we we have a measure called online sales quantity. And if we look at that measure, it's just going to be the, the sum of, of the uh, uh, quantity column from the online sales table. So the same thing that we've been looking at. But we have a, a number of filter functions that um, can apply time series math against a measure. And again, Total MTD is a filter function. It, or it's a table-based uh, function, I'm sorry. It's a table-based function that automatically filters a set of records in a date table um, based on a time series. So let me show you what that looks like. And I'm just going to create a new page. And I have 
my order date table right here. I'm going to throw the date column on here. I know that that's small. And let's go get the online sales quantity. I want to keep that in a table. And the online sales, online sales MTD, online sales quantity YTD, online sales quantity MTD. All right, so let's look at what this does. And uh, we'll just zoom in on this. Okay. So um, within Power BI, a, a date table has to be marked as a date table, and there's some qualifications for a date table. It has to contain a contiguous set of dates. Um, typically, you want to start at the beginning of the year and end at the end of the year. But uh, you can see that the, the first date that we have in this date table is, um, it's actually January 1st of 2020, but we don't have any values for that since it was New Year's Day. So um, as of the first date that I have values for, January 2nd, in the sales table, our sum of quantity is 68. Well, stands to reason that month to date would also be 68. On the third, it was 140 units. And then if we add 68 to 140, we get 208. So you can see what MTD is doing for us. So it's automatically looking at the date table and saying, okay, well, I know what month I'm in. I'm in January. And I'm going to accumulate these values until I get to the end of the month. All right. And, you know, similar functions exist in SQL. Similar functions exist in Excel. But what's notable is that this is a table-based function that is performing filtering for us. So if we jump back and look at, I didn't want to switch out of that. I just wanted to unzoom take a look at that function again, what we're doing is we're changing the filter context of the date table. So the, if we look at the beginning parenthesis and the end parenthesis, you can see that we pass two arguments. We pass in a measure, we say go calculate this measure against the date table and change the filter context of the date table depending on what date you're on. So if I'm on the 10th of the month, then the filter context of the date table is going to be the first through the 10th of the current month. So I'll go ahead and, and, and wrap up there. I'm hoping that this has been enlightening. Um, so here's some examples of time intelligence. Dates MTD works the same way, both uh, uh, total MTD and dates MTD are, are very similar. One just actually performs the calculation. This one actually just brings back a set of dates. And then I use the calculate function, a couple different ways of getting to the same place. There are a number of these previous year, dates, uh, previous periods to date, um, et cetera. All right. So uh, in summary, measures are calculated in the filter context of a table. Row context is what, what row I'm on, and that applies to another table through what's called filter propagation. That's what we've been uh, demonstrating. Calculate function applies filters to an expression. It can essentially convert row context into filter context. And then you've got a whole bunch of functions that can override filter context and control it in different ways, like all, all selected, and uh, some of the, the dates and time intelligence functions that I've shown you. Aggregator functions. Pretty simple, add stuff up, iterator functions, perform a calculation row by row. That's why they, they iterate over a table. All right, well, with that, you are welcome to reach out to me if you have questions. I'll go back to my title slide. Uh, oh, I don't have my contact information on here, but you're welcome to reach out through LinkedIn and uh, you can link with me there and uh, uh, also look up my blog. It's pretty easy to find at sqlserverbi.blog. And with that, um, thank you for your time.